thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor and pleasure to be here um, yeah, today. I would like to speak about eating behavior and show you how multidimensional it is, as well as uh, the potential of a positive perspective. But first of all, I would like to start with some background. Probably you have all heard about the so-called obesity epidemic. That is, for instance, in the USA, the obesity prevalence has increased from about 10% in the 1970s to more than 40% in 2020. And this means that nearly every second US American has a level of overweight that is associated with a number of health issues such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes. A prevailing approach to fight this development is um, to equate eating with nutrients and health. For instance, probably you have all seen these uh, nutrient and health labels on foods such as breakfast cereals that highlight the fat, sugar or fiber content. Also, we often find a focus on negative aspects of eating, as mirrored, for instance, in headlines uh, such as how stress eating is killing you. However, despite these approaches, the obesity prevalence continues to rise. Instead of health benefits, we are turning into a society of so-called paradox eaters. That is, people overeat foods that claim to be healthy. And this has been nicely studied, for instance, in a uh, paper from Provincia and colleagues who showed that the perceived healthiness of food led to overconsumption. So an important question is, why are these approaches not successful? And I think that one reason why this focus on nutrients is not successful is that no one sits down to eat a plate of nutrients, as has been nicely stated by Block and colleagues. Also, there's often a bright side, which can yield surprising results if we take a more comprehensive perspective and, also, and, and not only focus on the negative aspects of eating. And today, I would like to show you some data that highlight that eating is more than nutrients and health, and that we need to extend the negative focus and also include a positive perspective. And I would like to start um, with showing you some data of an international study uh, that nicely demonstrates how multidimensional eating behavior is. And in that study, we were especially interested in what constitutes traditional and modern eating behavior. You might ask yourself, why did we study traditional and modern eating behavior? There is a lot of research around the so-called nutrition transition that targets the shifts uh, in diets high in complex carbohydrates, in fiber plant-based uh, foods, that is rather a traditional diet, towards a modern diet which is high in fat, sugar and animal source foods. For instance, in this graph here, you can see uh, the increase in meat consumption uh, since the 1960s uh, across the world. And many researchers associated the shift towards modern diets with the increase in obesity prevalence and related diseases. However, when we look at our diets or eating behavior today and compare it to how it was maybe 100 years ago, one quickly finds that there are not only differences in what people eat, but also in how they eat. For instance, in this graph, you can see the increase in expenditures um, spent on food away from home in the USA since the 1930s and the decrease in um, expenditures spent on food at home. So this means that people are increasingly eating out. Um, so we thought that there are most likely multiple facets that constitute traditional and modern eating. There are probably this, or there is this nutrient and ingredients facet, um, but also it might be important where people eat and there might also be other facets um, that characterize traditional and modern eating behavior. However, research in this area seemed to be fragmented and a comprehensive compilation of the different facets of traditional and modern eating behavior was, was missing. So we aimed to bring these multiple facets uh, together and then to categorize them into different sub-dimensions and dimensions. Um, how did we do that? Well, first of all, we ran an extensive literature review and then we also uh, performed discussions with experts from 10 different countries. And I would like to ask you now, what is your guess? How many facets did we find to underlie traditional modern eating, such as fiber, fat, 
Any guesses? Ten. Ten? Okay. Who thinks more? <laughs> Less? <laughs> but we, we found more than um, 100 facets underlying this behavior and we needed uh, several pages to list all of them. So that was a wealth of information that we then in a second step um, categorized. And we found the two dimensions, what and how people eat, as well as 12 sub-dimensions underlying this behavior. And here you can see the 12 sub-dimensions as well as um, set, um, example facets underlying these with the T um, for traditional facets and M with for modern facets. And of course we find uh, the ingredient sub-dimensions. So it is important, for instance, how much fat uh, we consume. But then uh, traditional and modern eating is also characterized by the processing of foods, how it is processed also how it is prepared and in the how dimension for instance we find the temporal aspects play a role when do we eat spatial aspects where <coughs> or social aspects with whom do we eat and we have tested and verified this framework of conceptualizations of traditional and modern eating in 10 different countries so we have asked participants from the usa from mexico from brazil from ghana france germany turkey uh, india and um, china and japan to rate whether these facets are rather traditional or modern in their food cultures. And of course, there were differences between countries. For instance, we found that dairy products was rated as rather traditional in Turkey, but modern in Ghana. Similarly, sweet desserts were regarded to be part of traditional eating in Brazil, but modern in Ghana. Uh, however, we found one central similarity, and that was that across all the countries, all these 12 sub-dimensions were rated to underlie traditional and modern be eating behavior. So this seems to be, this multidimensionality seems to be something that we can generalize uh, across countries. And although this is all about traditional and modern eating behavior, I think most of these sub-dimensions are also generalizable to eating behavior in principle. So um, what we eat is somehow processed, it is somehow prepared, and it is not only about what we eat, but also how, for instance, when, where, and with whom we eat. So I hope that that showed you that eating is more than nutrients and health, but multidimensional. And there's increasing evidence that demonstrates that all these or various of these sub-dimensions are relevant for health and not only the ingredients, nutrients sub-dimension. Next of all, I would like to show you that not only eating behavior is multidimensional, but also its underlying drivers, function and motives, why people eat what they eat. And here I would like to start with a question and ask you to think of your last meal, maybe breakfast today, and ask you why did you eat what you ate. So who ate, for instance, because of hunger? Just lift your hand. Okay, who ate because of liking, good taste, pleasure, habit? Okay, what you see from that is that there are multiple motives why we eat what we eat. And we have, um, in a comprehensive study series, we have compiled 15 basic motives of why people eat what they eat. Um, this you can see here. This is somehow not how it should look like, but anyway, you can see that there are uh, biological motives, for instance, need and hunger, liking, visual appeal is an important motive but then also pleasure and affect regulation, emotional motives, we eat for these reasons, social motives such as uh, sociability, it's nice to spend time together with other people. Then we also find that habits, traditions are important reasons for why we eat what we eat. Then of course health related motives, weight control, health plays a role, and also economic motives such as convenience and price. And here you can see how often people from, the, from Germany, India, USA and Brazil reported to eat because of these motives, because of these reasons in general, on a scale from one never to seven always. And of course there might be country differences in the mean importance of these motives. For instance, social motives might be more important in India than in other countries. However, some specific statistical analysis showed that we can consistently find these 15 basic motives across the country. So this is something, this multidimensionality is something that we can again generalize across countries. 
And what this all implies is that for sustainable eating behavior changes, it might be important to consider this multidimensionality, this variety of motives, and not only focus on the health aspects. This could, for instance, mean that we look for healthy foods that of course are also tasty, that are affordable for people, that are conveniently accessible, etc. Okay, now we have seen that uh, both eating behavior as well as its underlying motives is multidimensional. Um, next, I would like to show you two examples that demonstrate um, why it is important to extend a negative focus and also include a positive perspective. And I would like to start with the uh, topic of stress eating and again ask you who eats more when stressed is a so-called habitual stress eater. You can again just lift your hand. Okay, who eats less when stressed? So it's a habitual stress less eater. Okay, there are also people and who does not change his eating behavior in response to stress. So there are also people. So what you see from this is that there are inter-individual differences in the response um, to stress. Usually, um, eating more when stressed is considered a maladaptive behavior that needs to be regulated to prevent long-term weight gain. However, um, life is not always stressful, right? So there are hopefully also um, times when we have positive situations. So with home time, compliments, vacation, etc. And as eating behavior has been shown to fluctuate across situations, for instance here you can see how snacking fluctuated across 24 hours, we asked ourselves whether stress eaters might compensate their more eating under stress in a positive situation. So we ran an experiment where we randomized habitual stress more and less eaters into a stressful, neutral and positive situation. In the stressful situation they were socially excluded by another participant, in a positive situation they were socially included. Afterwards they took part in a taste test where they could eat as much ice cream as they liked. <laughs> and here you can see how much participants ate. So in the neutral situation, we do not find a difference between the stress less eaters in the black bars and the stress more eaters in the white bars. So both groups ate approximately 110 grams of ice cream. What about the stressful condition? So here, as expected, we found that the stress as more eaters ate more. And usually from this picture it is concluded that stress eating is maladaptive and should be regulated to prevent long-term weight gain. However, this is not yet a full picture, right? So what if we include the positive situation? And here, <laughs> results were really interesting because we saw that the stress more eaters compensated their more eating under stress by eating less in the positive situation. Similarly, the stress Less eaters compensated their less eating under stress by eating more in this positive situation. And across the three situations, the two groups ate the same amount, so there was no difference anymore in overall consumption. And what this implies is that neither stress more eaters nor stress less eaters are in principle at risk to gain weight as long as there's a balance between situations, right? And it might be easier for stress more eaters to balance their situations than to change how they respond to stress. Okay, so this uh, example should show that a more comprehensive view, including a positive perspective, shows that stress eating has a bright side. Now I would like to show you a second example that um, demonstrates that a positive focus can even be related to health. And here, usually when we talk about a healthy body weight, the only way to maintain or have a healthy body weight seems to be achievable through dieting restriction, which often results in a lot of worries, concerns and guilt about eating. However, what about the bright side? When we enjoy eating, are satisfied with that, and eating is a pleasure, fun or even nice. Does this inevitably lead to unhealthy eating, obesity and disease? Or what if that would be related to healthy eating and healthy weight and, and health? This was something that we aimed to study. So we asked participants uh, in a study um, about their positive relationship with eating, how much they enjoyed it, were satisfied with it, etc. And then we also asked them how satisfied they were with their life in general and um, how often they consumed various foods that are considered as healthy, such as fruits, vegetables, and foods that are considered as unhealthy, such as sweets or salty snacks. And then we invited participants to take part in our study again six months later and assessed various health parameters such as the waist circumference, blood sugar, 
and whether people suffered from the metabolic syndrome, which is a condition um, of a combination of risk factors uh, that are specific for cardiovascular diseases. And then we investigated the relationship between this positive eating and this health parameters. And we found that people who were more positive about their eating reported healthier eating and were more satisfied with their life. Of course, these are cross-sectional results and correlation is not causality. So we don't know whether maybe people who eat healthier also are then more in turn more positive about their eating. So we also investigated the prospective relationship, the longitudinal relationship with the health parameters six months later. And we found that people who were more positive about their eating had a lower risk of developing an elevated waist circumference, a lower risk of developing an elevated blood sugar, and a lower risk of developing the metabolic syndrome. And of course, the effects were rather small. And we need much more evidence from intervention studies, for example, before we can conclude that this positive focus does indeed lead to health. However, for now, we do not find any evidence that being positive about one's eating is related to worse health out outcomes than being less positive, right? And so I would suggest that we start to think about that this positive focus might be related to health. Taken together, we have now seen that eating is more than nutrients and health, but that both eating behavior and its underlying motives are multidimensional. Also, we have seen that we need to extend the negative focus and also include a positive perspective. With a more comprehensive view, we saw that stress <coughs> eating has a bright side, and last I, show you, I showed you data that a positive focus might be even able to promote health behavior and health. I would like to end now with an outlook. I have started my talk with the obesity epidemic, prevailing approaches to fight it, and have presented you some alternative approaches. And also, we still need much more evidence before we can say whether these alternative approaches are more successful than the prevailing ones. I think that they are in principle also relevant for other challenges that require a change in eating behavior, such as global warming. I'm sure you have all seen these graphs that demonstrate the rise in temperatures across the years. And plant-based diets are among the high impact individual actions to reduce CO2 emissions, which are a major driver of climate change. And so to counteract global warming, European countries need to dramatically reduce the consumption of animal products. And my suggestion would be to keep these alternative approaches in mind on a way to get there. Thank you very much.